Ram, the sky of Ikshvaku, Chapter Eleven. You'll make an excellent chief of police," said Roshni, her eyes glittering with childlike excitement. "Crime will decrease, and that will be good for our beleaguered people." Roshni sat in the palace garden with a restrained but disappointed Ram, who had been hoping for a greater responsibility like the deputy chief of the army, but he wasn't about to reveal this to her. I'm not sure if I'll be able to handle it," said Ram. "A good chief of police needs the support of the people, and you imagine you don't have it?" Ram smiled wanly. "Roshni, I know you don't lie. Do you really think people will support me? Everyone blames me for the defeat at the hands of Lanka. I am tainted by the seven thousand and thirty-two." Roshni leaned forward and spoke earnestly. "You have only interacted with the elite, the ones who were born right." People like us, yes, they do not like you. But there is another Ayodhya Ram, where people who were not born right exist. There is no love lost between them and the elite. And remember, they will be sympathetic towards anyone the elite ostracizes, even one from the nobility itself. The common folk will like you simply because the elite don't like you. They might even follow you for the same reason. Ram had lived in the bubble of the royal experience. He was intrigued by this possibility. People like us don't step out in the real world. We don't know what's going on out there. I have interacted with the common people and I think I understand them to some extent. The elite have done you a favor by hating you. They have made it possible for you to endear yourself to the common man. I'm sure you can make them to listen to you. I know you can bring crime under control in this city. Dramatically so, you can do a lot of good. Believe in yourself as much as I believe in you, my brother. Within a year the reforms that Ram instituted began to have a visible effect. He tackled the main problem head on. Most people were unaware about the laws. Some did not even know the names of the law books called smritis. This was because there were too many of them containing contradictory laws that had accumulated over centuries. The Manu Smriti was well known, but most of people were unaware that there were versions of it as well. For instance, Brihad Manu Smriti. There were other popular ones too: the Yajnava Kalya Smriti, Narad Smriti, Apastam Smriti, Atri Smriti, Yam Smriti, and Vyas Smriti, to name a few. The police applied sections from the law that they were familiar with in an ad hoc fashion. The court judges were sometimes aware of the other Smritis, depending on the communities they were born into. Confusion was exacerbated when the police would arrest under law of one smriti, while the judge would base his judgment on the law from another smriti. This result was almighty chaos. The guilty would escape by exploiting the loopholes and contradictions among the smritis. Many innocents, however, languished in prisons due to ignorance, leading to horrific overcrowding. Ram understood that he had to simplify and unify the law. He studied the smritis and carefully selected laws that he felt were fair, coherent, simple, and relevant to the times. Henceforth, this law code would govern Ayodhya. All other smritis would be rendered obsolete. The laws were inscribed on the stone tablets and put up all at the temples in Ayodhya. The most important among them being engraved at the end. Ignorance of the law is not a legitimate excuse. Town criers were assigned the task of reading the code aloud every morning. It was only a matter of time before the laws were known to all. Ram was soon given a respectful title by the common people. Ram, the lawgiver. His second reform was even more revolutionary. He gave the police force the power to implement the law without any fear or favor. Ram understood a simple fact. Policemen desired respect from society. They hadn't been given the opportunity to earn it earlier. If they unhesitatingly took action against by any lawbreaker, high and mighty though he may be, they would be feared and respected. Ram himself repeatedly demonstrated that the law applied equally to him. In an oft-quoted incident, Ram returned to the city after the dusk, when the fort gates had been shut. The gatekeeper opened the gates for the prince. Ram upbraided him for breaking the law. The gates were not to be opened for anyone at the night time. Ram slept outside the city walls at night and entered the city the next morning. The ordinary people of Ayodhya talked about it for months, though it was studiously ignored by the nobles.
What did get the elite into a tizzy was Ram's intervention in cases where members of the nobility attempted to bro back the police when the law caught the up with them. They were aghast that they were being brought to the book, but soon understood that there will be no leniency. The hatred of Ram increased manifold. They began to call him dictatorial and dangerous, but the people loved him even more. This eldest prince of Ayodhya, crime rates collapsed as the criminals were either thrown in jail or speedily ex- executed. Innocents were increasingly spared in a city that steadily became safer. Women began to venture out alone at night. Ram was rightfully credited with this dramatic improvement in their lives. It would be decades before the name of Ram would transform into a splendid legend, but the journey had begun. For among the common folk, a star was slowly spluttering to life. You are making too many enemies, my son, said Kaushalya. You should not be so rigid about enforcing the law. Kaushalya finally summoned Ram to her private chamber, having received too many complaints from the nobles. She was worried that in his zeal, her son was losing the few allies he still had in court. The rule of law cannot be selective, Ma, said Ram. The same law has to apply to everyone. If the nobles don't like it, they should not break the law. I am not discussing the law, Ram, if you think that penalizing one of the generals Mirgasya's key aides will please your father, you're wrong. He's completely under Kekai's spell. Mirgasya, the army chief, had become increasingly powerful as Dashrath sank into depression. He was the magnet around whom all those who opposed powerful Queen Kekai had coalesced. His reputation of fiercely defending his loyalists, even if they committed crimes or even were th- thoroughly incompetent, ensured ferocious allegiance. Kikai intensely disliked him for his willful disregard for her wishes, which influenced Dashrath's attitude towards the general. Recently, Ram has used the law to recover the land that one of Mrigasya's aid had illegally appropriated from the poor villagers. Ram had even had the termity to enforce a penalty on the aid, something nobody had dared to do with the men who surrounded the most powerful general. General Megasya and Kekaima's politics do not interest me. His aid broke the law. That's all there is to it. The nobility will do as they please, Ram. Not if I can help it, Ram. Nobility is about being noble, Ma. It's about the way of Arya. It's not about your birth, but how you conduct yourself. Being a noble is a great responsibility, not a birthright. Ram, why don't you understand? General Megasya is our only ally. All the other powerful nobles are in Kekai's camp. He is the only one who can stand up to her. We are safe as for as long as we have Megasya and his coterie on our side. What does this have to do with the law? asked Ram. Kaushalya consciously made an effort to contain her irritation. Do you know how difficult it is to me to build support for you? Everyone blames you for Lanka. When her comment was met with the stony silence, Kaushalya turned prosatory. I'm not suggesting that it was your fault, my child, but this is the reality. We must be pragmatic. Do you want to be the king or not? I want to be a good king or else, believe me, I'd rather not be one. Kaushalya closed her eyes in exasperation. Ram, you seem to live in your own theoretical world. You have to learn to be practical. Know that I love you and I'm only trying to help you. If you love me, Ma, then understand what I'm made of. Ram spoke calmly, but there was a steely determination in his eyes. This is my Janma Bhumi, my land of birth. I have to serve it by leaving it better than I found it. I can fulfill my Kamakarma as a king, as a police chief or as even a simple villager. Ram, you don't... Kaushalya was interrupted by a loud announcement. Her Highness Kekai, Queen of Ayodhya. Ram immediately got to his feet, as did Kaushalya. He discreetly glanced at his mother, noting the impotent anger in her eyes. Kekai approached her with a smile on her lips, her hands folded in a namaste. Namaste, Didi. Please accept my sincere apologies for disturbing you during your private time with your son. That's quite all right, Kekai, remarked Kaushalya with studied affability. I'm sure it's something important. Yes, it is actually, said Kekai, turning to Ram. Your father has decided to go up on a hunting trip, Ram. A hunting trip? asked a surprised Ram. Dashrath had not gone a big game hunting in Ram's living memory. His battle injury had precluded even such simple pleasures from the life to the once great hunter. Yes, 
I would have sent Bharat along with him. I could do with some of my de- favorite deer meat. But as you know, Bharat is in Dranga or a diplomatic mission. I was wondering if I could lay this wondrous um, responsibility on your able shoulders. Ram smiled slightly. He knew Kekai wanted him to accompany Dashrath in order to protect him and not for any choices of meat. But Kekai never said anything derogatory about Dashrath in public and the royal family was public for her. Ram folded his hands into a namaste. It will be my honor to serve you, Choti Ma. Kekai smiled, said thank you. What is she doing here? asked Dashrath gruffly. Kaushalya had just been announced by the doorman in Kekai's wing of the royal palace. Dashrath and Kekai lay in bed. She reached out and tugged Dashrath's long hair behind his ear. Just finish whatever it is and come back quickly. You will also have to get up, my love, said Dashrath. Kekai signed in irritation and rolled off the bed. She quickly picked up her angvastram and placed it across her shoulder, rolling the other end around her right wrist. She walked over to Dashrath and helped him off the bed. She went down on her knees and straightened his toti. Finally, she picked up Dashrath's angvastram and placed it across his shoulder. She then helped him walk into the reception room and bade him wait. Let Her Majesty in, ordered Kekai. Kaushalya entered the room with two attendants in the top. One of them carried a large golden plate on which placed Dashrath's battle sword. The other attendant carried a small puja thali. Kekai straightened up in surprise. Dashrath seemed lost as usual. Didi, said Kekai folding her hands together in a namaste. What a pleasure to see you in twice in the same day. The pleasure is all mine, Kekai, said Kaushalya. You mentioned that His Majesty is going on a hunt. I thought I should perform the proper ceremony. The ritual of the chief wife of a warrior ceremonially, handing the sword to her departing husband, had become down through the ancient times. Things have not gone too well whenever I have not presented His Majesty with the sword, said Kaushalya. Dashrath's vacant expression changed suddenly. He frowned as if he was struck by the enormity of the not-so-subtle implication. Kaushalya had not handed him the sword when he set out for Karachappa, and that had been his first defeat. He slowly took a step forward, his first wife. Kaushalya took the small puja thali from her attendant and looped in in small circles around Dashrath's face seven times. Then she took a pinch of vermilion from the plate and smeared it across Dashrath's forehead in a vertical tilak. Come back victorious. Kekai sniggered, interrupting the ceremony. He is not going to war, Didi. Dashrath ignored Kekai. Complete the line, Kaushalya. Kaushalya swallowed nervously, half convinced now that this was a big mistake, that she should not have listened to Sumitra. But she completed the ritual statement. Come back victorious or do not come back at all. Kaushalya thought she detected a flicker of fire in her husband's eyes, reminiscent of the young Dashrath, who lived for thrill and glory. Where's my sword? Dashrath demanded as he extended his arms solemnly. Kaushalya immediately turned and handed the puja thali back to her attendant. She then picked up the sword with both her hands, faced her husband and bowed ceremonially and handed him the sword. Dashrath held it firmly as if drawing energy from it. Kikai looked at Dashrath and then Kaushalya as she narrowed her eyes deep in thought. This must be Sumitra's doing. Kaushalya couldn't have planned this by herself. Perhaps I have made a mistake in asking Ram to accompany Dashrath. Royal hunts were grand affairs that lasted many weeks. A large entourage accompanied the emperor on the expedition, moving the headquarters of the court to a hunting lodge built deep in the great forest to the far north of Ayodhya. Action commenced on the day after their arrival. Their technique involved numerous soldiers spreading out in a giant circle circumscribing almost 50 kilometers sometimes. They beat loud drums ceaselessly as they slowly moved towards the center, steadily drawing the animals into an increasingly restricted area, at times a watering hole. The animals would then be attacked in a kill zone, where the emperor and his hunting party would indulge in this royal sport. The shirt stood on a howdah atop, the royal elephant. Ram and Lakshman were seated behind him. The emperor thought he heard the soft chuff of an unexpecting tiger. He ordered the mahout to charge forward. Within no time, Dashrath's elephant had separated from the rest of the hunting party. He was alone with his sons. They were surrounded on all sides by the dense, dense vegetation. Many trees were so tall that they towered over the elephant. 
blocking out much of the sunlight. It was almost impossible to see beyond the first few lines of trees into the impenetrable darkness. Lakshman leaned in and whispered to Ram, Dada, I don't think there is any tiger there. Ram gestured for Lakshman to remain quiet as he observed his father standing in front. Dashrath was barely able to contain his enthusiasm. His body weight was on his strong left foot. His inert right foot was stabilized with the innovative mechanism built into the Howdah platform. A spiraling circular base with a sturdy column fixed in the center. Bootstraps attached to the base secured his foot as it leaned on the column, the leather support extending all the way to his knee. The circular base allowed him to swift movement for shooting his arrows in all directions. Nevertheless, his back showed the signs of a visible strain as he held the bow aloft with the arrow knocked on the bowstring. Ram would have preferred if this father did not exert his weakened body so, but he also admired the spirit that drove him to push his corporal frame beyond its natural limits. There's nothing there, I tell you, whispered Lakshman. Shh, said Ram. Lakshman fell silent. Suddenly, Dashrath flexed his right shoulder and pulled out the bowstring back. Ram winced as he watched the technique. Dashrath's elbow was not in line with the arrow, which would put together pressure on his shoulder and triceps. Sweat beads formed on Emperor's forehead, but he held position. A moment later, he realized the arrow and a loud roar confirmed that it had found its mark. Ram reveled in the spirit of all-conquering hero that his father had once been. Dashrath swiveled awkwardly at, on the howdah, looked at Lakshman with a sneer. Don't underestimate me, young man. Lakshman immediately bowed his head. I'm sorry, father, I didn't mean to. Order some soldiers to fetch the carcass of that tiger. They will find it with an arrow pierced through his right eye, buried in its brain. Yes, father, I'll... Father screamed Ram as he lunged forward, drawing a knife quickly from the scabbard tied around his waist. There was a loud rustle of leaves as a leopard emerged on a branch, overhanging the howdah. The sly beast had planned its attack meticulously. Dashrath was distracted as the leopard leapt from the branch. Ram's timing, however, was perfect. He jumped up and plunged his knife into the airborne animal's chest. But the suddenness of the charge made Ram miss his mark. The knife didn't find the leopard's heart. The beast was injured but not dead. It roared in fury and slashed with its claws. But Ram wrestled with the leopard as he tried to pull the knife out so he could take another stab. But it was stuck. The animal pulled back and sank his teeth into the prince's left tricep. Ram yelled in pain as he attempted to push the animal out of the howdah. The leopard pulled back its head ripping out flesh and drawing large spurts of blood. It instinctively struggled to move Ram's neck to asphyxiate the prince. Ram pulled back his right fist and hit the leopard hard across its head. Lakshman, in the meantime, was desperately trying to reach Ram even as Dashrath blocked his way. Tied, he as he was to the stationary column. Lakshman jumped high, caught an overhanging branch and swung out of the howdah in an arc. He propelled himself forward and landed in the front of the howdah, right behind the leopard. He drew his knife as the leopard pulled back again to bite into Ram. Lakshman thrust brutally and by good fortune, the blade sank into the leopard's eye. The animal howled in pain as a shower of blood sprang out of its shattered eye socket. Lakshman strained his mighty shoulder and jammed hard, pushing the knife deep into the animal's brain. The beast struggled for a brief moment and then fell lifeless. Lakshman picked up the leopard's body with his bare hands and threw it to the ground. Ram had collapsed in a pool of blood. Ram screamed Dashrath, twisting desperately as his right leg remained fixed to the column. Lakshman turned to the mehut, back to the camp. The mehut sat paralyzed, shaken by the sudden turn of events. Dashrath bellowed his imperial command. Back to the camp, now! Torches were lit across the hunting camp, seized with the phenetic activity late into the night. The injured prince of Ayodhya laid in the massive and luxurious tent of the emperor. He should have been in the medical tent, but Dashrath had insisted that his son be tended to a comfort of the emperor's living quarters. Ram's pallid body was covered in bandages, weak from the tremendous loss of blood. Prince Ram whispered the doctor as he touched the prince's tent gently. Do you have to wake him up? demanded Dashrath, sitting on a comfortable chair placed to the left of the bed. Yes, your majesty, said the doctors. 
he must take his medicine now. As the doctor repeated Ram's name, the prince opened his eyes, blinking slowly to adjust the light. He saw the doctor holding the bowl of medicine. He opened his mouth and swallowed the paste, wincing at the bitter taste. The doctor turned, bowed towards the emperor and left the room. Ram was about to slip back into sleep and then he noticed the ceremonial gold umbrella on the top of the bed. As its centre was a massive sun in intricate embroidery with rays streaming boldly out of in all directions. The Suryavanshi symbol. Ram's eyes flew open as he struggled to get up. He wasn't supposed to be sleeping on the emperor's bed. Lie down, commanded Dashrath, raising his hand. Lakshman rushed over to the bed and gently tried to calm his brother down. In the name of Lord Surya, lie down, Ram, said Dashrath. Ram fell back on the bed as he looked towards Dashrath. Father, I'm sorry I shouldn't be on your... Dashrath cut him off mid-sentence with a wave of his hand. Ram couldn't help but notice a subtle change in his father's appearance. A spark in his eyes, steel in his voice, and an alertness that brought back stories his mother would constantly repeat about the kind of the man Dashrath had once been. Here sat a powerful man who wouldn't take kindly to his orders being disregarded. Ram had never seen him like this. Dashra turned to his attendants. Leave us. Lakshman rose to join the attendants. Not you, Lakshman, said Dashra. Lakshman stopped in his tracks and waited for further orders. Dashra stared at the tiger and leopard skin spread out in the corner of the tent. Trophies of the animals he and his sons has hunted. Why? asked Dashra. Father? asked Ram, confused. Why did you risk your life for me? Ram did not utter a word. Dashrath continued, I have blamed you for my defeat. My entire kingdom blamed you, cursed you. You have suffered all your life and yet you never rebelled. I thought it was because you were weak. But weak people celebrate when twist of fate hurt their tormentors. And yet you risked your life to trying to save me. Why? Ram answered with one simple sentence. Because that is my dharma, father. Dashrath looked quizzically at Ram. This was the first real conversation he was having with his eldest son. Is that the only reason? What the other reason can be? asked Ram. Oh, I don't know, said Dashrath, snorting with disbelief. How about angling for other position for the crown prince? Ram couldn't help smiling at the irony. The nobility will never accept me, father. Even if I am able to convince you, it is not in my scheme of things. What I did today is what I must always do. Be true to my dharma. Nothing is more important than dharma. So you don't believe that you are to blame for my defeat at the hands of Ravan, is it? It doesn't matter what I think, father. You didn't answer my question, Ram. Ram remained silent. Dashrath leaned forward. Answer me, prince. I don't understand how the universe keeps track of our karma across many births, father. I know I could not have done anything in this birth to make you lose the battle. Maybe it was something to do with my previous birth. Dashrath laughed softly, amazed at his son's equanimity. Do you know whom I blame? asked Dashrath. If I were truly honest, if I had the courage to look deep into my heart, the answer would have been obvious. It was my fault, only my fault. I was reckless and foolhardy. I attacked without a plan, driven only by anger. I paid the price, didn't I? My first defeat ever and my last battle forever. Father, there are many. Do not interrupt me, Ram. I am not finished. It was so easy. I just had to say it and everyone agreed with me. I made your life living hell from the day you were born. You should hate me. You should hate Ayodhya. I don't hate anyone, Father. Dashrath stared hard at his son. After what seemed like an eternity, his face broke into a peculiar smile. I don't know whether you've suppressed your true feelings completely or you generally don't care about the ignominy that people have heaped upon you. Whatever be the truth, you have held strong. The entire universe conspired to break you and here you are, still unbarred. What metal have you been forged in, my son? Ram's eyes moistened as the emotions welled within him. He could handle disdain and empathy from his father. He was used to it. Respect was difficult to deal with. I was forged from your metal, my father. Dashrath laughed softly. He was discovering his son. What are your differences with Mirgasya? asked Dashrath. Ram was surprised to discover that his father kept a track of court matters. None at all, father. Then why did you penalize one of his men? 
He broke the law, replied Ram. Don't you know how powerful Migrasya is? Aren't you afraid of him? Nobody is above the law, father. None can be more powerful than Dharma. Dashrath laughed. Not even me? A great emperor said something beautiful once. Dharma is above all, even the king. Dharma is above the god themselves. Dashrath frowned. Who said this? You did, father. When you took the oath at your coronation decades ago, I was told that you had paraphrased our great ancestor, Lord Ikshavaku himself. Dashrat stared at Ram as he jogged his memory to remember the powerful man he has once been. Go to sleep, my son, said Dashrat. You need the rest. Chapter 12 Ram was awakened by the doctor at the beginning of the second prahar for his next dose of medicine. As he looked around the room, his eyes fell on a visibly delighted Lakshman, standing by his bedside, bedecked in formal dhoti and angvastram. The saffron angvastram had a Suryavanshi sun emblazoned across its length. Sun, Ram turned his head to the left and saw his father attired in regal finery. The emperor sat on his travel throne. The Suryavanshi crown was placed on his head. Father, said Ram, good morning. Dashrath nodded crisply. It will be a fine morning, no doubt. The emperor turned towards the entrance of his tent. Is anyone there? A guard pulled the curtain aside and rushed in, saluting rapidly. Let the nobles in. The guard saluted once again and retraced his steps. Within minutes, the nobles entered the tent in a single file. They gathered in a semicircle around the emperor, waiting with a solemn air of ceremony. Let me see my son. The nobles parted immediately, surprised at the voice of the authority emerging from their emperor. Dashrath looked directly at Ram. Rise, he said. Lakshman rushed over to help Ram, but Dashrath raised his hand firmly to stop him from doing so. The assemblage stood rooted as it watched a severely weakened Ram struggle to raise himself, stand on his feet and hobble towards his father. He saluted slowly once he reached the emperor. Dashrath locked his eyes with his son, inhaled deeply and spoke clearly. Kneel. Ram was unable to move, overwhelmed by a sense of shocked disbelief. Tears welled up in his eyes, despite his willing not to do that so. Dashrath's voice softened lightly. Kneel, my son. Ram struggled with emotions as he sought the support of a table close at hand. Laboriously, he went down on one knee, bowed his head and awaited the call of destiny. Dashrath spoke evenly, his voice reverberating even outside the royal tent. Rise, Ram Chandra, protector of the Raghu clan. A collective gasp resounded through the tent. Dashrath raised his hands and courtiers fell into a taut silence. Ram still had his head bowed, lest his enemies see the tears in his eyes. He stared at the floor till he regained absolute control. Then he looked up at his father and spoke in a calm voice. May all the gods of our great land continue to protect you, my father. Dashrath's eyes seemed to penetrate the soul of his eldest son. A hint of smile appeared on his face as he looked towards his nobles. Leave us. General Megasya attempted to say something. Dashrath interrupted him with a glare. What part of leave us did you not understand, Megasya? My apologies, your majesty, said Megasya as he saluted the, and led the nobles out. Dashrath, Ram and Lakshman were soon alone in the tent. Dashrath leaned heavily to his feet as he made an effort to get up, resisting Lakshman's offer to help. Once on his feet, he beckoned Lakshman, placed his hands on his massive son's shoulders and hobbled over to Ram. Ram, too, had risen slowly to his feet and stood erect. His face was inscrutable, his eyes awash with emotions, though coupled with surprising tranquility. Dashrath placed his hands on Ram's shoulders. Become the man I could have become, the man I did not become. Ram whispered softly, his vision clouded. Father, make me proud, said Dashrath with tears finally welling up in his eyes. Father, make me proud, my son. All doubts about the tectonic shifts that had taken place in the royal family were laid to rest when Dashrath moved out of Kekai's wing of Ayodhya Palace. 
he had been unable to convincingly answer Kekai's repeated and forceful questions as to why he had suddenly made Ram the crown prince. Dashrat moved in along with his personal staff to Kaushalya's wing. The bewildered chief queen of Ayodhya had suddenly regained her status, but the timid Kaushalya was careful with her new found elevation. No changes were attempted, though it was difficult to say whether this was because of her diffidence or fear that the good fortune might not last. Ram's brother were delighted. Bharat and Shatrughan had rushed to his chambers on their return from Branga, word having reached them even as they travelled back home. Roshni had decided to join them. Congratulations, Dada, said Bharat, embracing his elder brother with obvious delight. You deserve it said Shatrugan. He surely does, said Roshni, her face suffused with joy. I ran into Guru Vashishta on my way here. He mentioned that the reduction in the crime rate in Ayodhya is only a tiny example of what Ram can truly achieve. You bet, said Lakshman enthusiastically. All right, all right, said Ram. You're embarrassing me now. Ah, grinned Bharat. That's the point of it all, Dada. As far as I know, speaking the truth has not been banned in any scripture, said Shatrugan. And we'd better believe him, Dada, said Lakshman, laughing heartily. Shatrugan is the only man I know who can recite every single Veda, Upanishad, Brahmana, Aranaka, Vedanga, Smriti and everything else communicated or known to man. The weight of his formidable brain pressed so hard upon his body that it arrested his vertical growth. Bharat joined in. Shatrugan boxed Lakshman playfully on his well-toned abdomen, chuckling along the good naturally. Lakshman laughed boisterously. Do you really think I can feel your feeble hits, Shatrugan? You may have got the, all the brain cells created in Ma's womb, but I got all the brawn. The brothers laughed even louder. Roshni was happy that despite all the political intrigue in Ayodhya court, the princes shared a healthy camaraderie with each other. Clearly, the gods were looking out for the future of kingdom. She patted on Ram's shoulder. I have to go. Go where? asked Ram. Saraya, you are aware that I hold a medical camp in our surrounding villages once a month, right? It's Saraya's turn this month. Ram looked a little worried. I will send some bodyguards with you. The villages around Saraya are not safe. Roshni smiled. Thanks to you, criminal activity is not at all a time law. Your law enforcement has ensured that. There is nothing to worry about. I have not been able to achieve that completely and you know it. Look, there's no harm in being safe. Roshni noticed that Ram was still wearing his rakhi. She had tired on his wrist a long time ago. She smiled. Don't worry, Ram. It's a day trip. I'll be back before nightfall. And I will not be alone. My assistants will be accompanying me. We will give the villagers free medicines and treatment if required. Nobody will hurt me. Why would they want? Bharat, who had been listening in on the conversation, stepped up and put his arm around Roshni's shoulder. You are a good woman, Roshni. Roshni smiled in a childlike manner. That I am. The blazing afternoon sun did not deter Lakshman, Ayodhya's finest rider from honouring his skills. He knew that the ability of horse and horseman to come to a sudden halt was a critical advantage in battle. To practice his arts, he chose a spot some distance away from the city where sheer cliffs descended into rapids of the Sarayu deep below. Come on, shouted Lakshman, spurring his horse on it as galloped towards the cliff edge. As his horse thundered dangerously near the edge of the precipice, Lakshman waited till the last moment, leaned forward in his saddle and wrapped his left arm around the horse's neck even as he pulled the reins hard with his right. The magnificent beast responded instantly by rearing up on its hind legs. The rear hooves left a mark on the ground as the horse stopped a few feet away from the certain death. Gracefully dismounting, Lakshman stroked its mane in appreciation. Well done, well done. The horse tail switched in acknowledgement of the praise. Once again, the animal had had enough to snort its refusal with a vigorous shake of its head. Lakshman laughed softly as he patted the horse, remounted and steered the reins in the opposite direction. All right. Let's go home. As he rode through the woods, a meeting was in progress a short distance away. One he may have liked to eavesdrop on, had he been aware of. Guru Vashishta was engrossed in deep discussion with the same mysterious Naga. That said, I'm sorry you failed.
Vashishta completed his sentence. The Guru had returned to Ayodhya after a long time and unexplained absence. This is not the word I would have used, Guruji. It's appropriate though, but it's not just for our failure. It's a failure of Vashishta stopped mid sentence as he thought he heard a sound. What is it? asked the Naga. Did you hear something? asked Vashishta. The Naga looked around, listened carefully for a few seconds, and then shook his head. What about Prince Ram? asked the Naga, resuming the conversation. Are you aware that your friend is on his way here seeking him? I know that. What do you intend to do? What can I do? asked Vashishta, raising his hands helplessly. Ram will have to handle this himself. They heard an unmistakable sound of a twig snapping. Perhaps it was an animal. The Naga murmured cautiously, I had better go. Yes, agreed Vashishta. He quickly mounted his horse and looked at Vashishta with your permission. Vashishta smiled and folded his hands into a namaste. Go with Lord Rudra, my friend. The Naga returned his namaste. Have faith in Lord Rudra, Guruji. The Naga gently tapped his horse into motion and rode away. It's only a sprain, Roshni reassured the child as she wrapped a bandage around his ankle. It will heal in a day or two. Are you sure? asked the worried mother. Numerous villagers from surrounding settlements had gathered at the Saraya village square. Roshni had patiently attended them to all. This was the last patient. Yes, said Roshni as she patted the child on his head. Now listen to me. She cupped the child's face with her hands. No climbing trees or running around for the next few days. You have to take it easy till your ankle heals. The mother cut in. I will ensure that he stays at home. Good, said Roshni. Hey Roshni Didi, said child, pouting with pretend annoyance. Where is my sweet? Roshni laughed as she beckoned one of her assistants. She pulled out a sweet from his bag and handed it to the delighted child. She ruffled his hair and then rose from her stool. Stretching her back, she turned to the village chief. If you will excuse me, I should be leaving now. Are you sure, my lady? asked the chief. It's late and you may not be able to reach Ayodhya before nightfall. The city gates will be shut. No, I think I'll make it in time, said a determined Roshni. I have to. My mother wants me back in Ayodhya tonight. She has planned a celebration and I need to be there for it. All right, my lady, as you wish, said the chief. Thank you so much once again. I don't know what we would do without you. The one you must truly thank is Lord Brahma, for he has given me the skills to be of use to you. The chief, as always, bent down respectfully to touch her feet. Roshni, as always, stepped back. Please, don't embarrass me by touching my feet. I am younger than you. The chief folded his hands together in a namaste. May Lord Rudra bless you, my lady. May he bless us all, said Roshni. She walked up to her horse and mounted swiftly. Her assistants had already gathered all their medical material and had mounted on their horses. At a signal from Roshni, the trio rode out of the village. Moments later, eight horse-mounted men appeared at the chief's front gate. They were from a nearby village called Isla and had taken some medicines from Roshni earlier in the day. Their village had been stuck by an epidemic of viral fever. One of the riders was an adolescent called Dhenuka, the son of the Isla village chief. Brothers, said the chief, have you got everything you need? Yes, said Dhenuka, but where is Lady Roshni? I wanted to thank her. The village chief was surprised. Dhenuka was famous for his rude, uncouth behaviour, but then he had met Roshni for the first time today. She must have impressed even his rowdy youth with her decency and goodness. She has ridden out already. She needed to get to Ayodhya before nightfall. Right, said Dhenuka, scanning the road leading out of the village. He smiled and spurred his horse into action. Can I help you, my lady? asked Dhenuka. Roshni turned around, surprised at the intrusion. They had made good time and she had stopped for some rest near the banks of Sarayu River. They were an hour's ride from Ayodhya. At first, she didn't recognize him but soon smiled in acknowledgement. That's all right, Dhenuka, said Roshni. Our horses needed some rest. I hope one of my assistants explained how the medicines should be administered to your people. Yes, they have, said Dhenuka, smiling strangely. Roshni suddenly felt uneasy. Her gut instinct told her that she must leave. Well, I hope everyone in your village gets the better soon. She walked up to her horse and reached for the reins. 
Tenuka immediately jumped off his horse and held Roshni's hand, pulling her back. What's the rush, my lady? Roshni moved him back and retreated slowly. The other members of the Enuka's gang had dismounted by then. Three of them moved towards her assistant. A terrifying chill went up Roshni's spine. I, I helped your people. Denuka grinned ominously. Oh, I know. I'm hoping you can help me too. Roshni suddenly turned around and ran. Three men took off after her and caught up in no time. One of them slapped her hard. As blood burst from forth Roshni's injured lips, the second man twisted her hand brutally behind her back. Denuka ambled up slowly, reached out and caressed her face. A noble woman. Hmm, this is going to be fun. His gang burst out laughing. Dada screamed Lakshman as he rushed into Ram's office. Ram did not raise his eyes as he continued to pore over the documents on his desk. It was the first hour of the second Prahar and he had expected some peace and quiet. Ram spoke with casual detachment, continuing to read the document in his hand. What's the matter now, Lakshman? Dada? Lakshman was choked with emotion. Laksh? Ram stopped mid-sentence as he looked up and saw the tears streaming down Lakshman's face. What happened? Dada, Roshni Didi. Ram immediately stood up and his chair hurtled back. What happened to Roshni? Dada, where is she? asked Ram.